Well, uh, thank you very much for having us here today. And uh, um, as you heard, uh, what we want to try and do at City Bible Forum is to partner with you and see you as a missionary that needs empowering and uh, help when you're scattered and away from gathering together with other Christians. And we can do that with you, our particular niche as the workplace. So if you'd like help with that, come and talk to me at the end of the service and um, we'll try and uh, put you in touch with other Christians perhaps in the same field that you're in or in the same part of uh, the workplace. We also work outside the city as well. Um, uh, Adelaide is uh, a small city and so there, there are also other pockets where we've got people who, as Christians, who try and help each other to be witnesses in those areas. And we try and do it in the least weird way possible, as Sharon said. Um, it's great to be with you, and particularly to... Uh, it's an honour to be able to finish off what has been an amazing few days, uh, where, in your title, you call yourself City of Reach, rather than Oakton Baptist these days. And that says all about where you're trying to um, head and what you're trying to do. You're trying to reach... Um, into your city um, and understand it and reach it for Jesus. And the conference was called Reach Too. So um, what I want to do with you today is to try and think about how you're going to do that in the coming week and give you some practical tips on that. Can I also say to you that Bible study series on Daniel would be gold to keep doing over the coming months because Daniel is a book... If there is ever a book in the Bible that tells you what it's like to live as a minority where the majority don't believe in God um, and how you take your stand in that world, Daniel's the book to read. So take that home with you today and use, uh, use it and read it over the coming weeks. Well, let me begin by saying uh, I wonder whether you've ever found yourself trying to fill in time in a city. Uh, you found yourself in a place and uh, so maybe you were delayed, you know, by plane or something or maybe uh, you've all split up and gone to different things for the day to see the things you wanted to look at and you're going to meet back at this rendezvous spot. And so there you are, you're waiting at that spot and you're killing time alone in a big city. Now that is where we take up Paul, the great missionary, in Acts chapter 17 Verse 16, he is waiting around in Athens for his companions on that mission to join him for them to keep going on that mission. Now, Athens would have to be a wonderful city to be found in to kill time, uh, if you know anything about it. And Paul would have had this city described to him from his childhood. It was the cradle of civilization. It was the cultural capital of the world in its day. And even though it's par it, it was moving past that and Rome was now eclipsing it as the centre of the world, it still was the birthplace of so much of their cultural heritage of the known world at that time. The nearest equivalent for me was to go to London. Um, I'd never ever been there and the funny thing was when I went, I felt like I knew it. And that's because I'd grown up with a Monopoly board for most of my life. <laughs> and so all the, oh, that's Pall Mall and so on. Um, so it was an amazing place. And as I walked around, I think, I think this was the scene from a James Bond movie. <laughs> and then, you know, there's London Bridge and it's not falling down like the nursery rhyme said. And so it was a weird feeling to be somewhere that you'd learnt about for a lot of your life and had been part of your growing up, finally you were there in that place. Now, what did Paul do when he got to Athens? Verse 16 tells you. He, well, he could have been spellbound by the architecture, couldn't he, and the history and the education of the place, but the beauty and the brilliance of that place did not dazzle him like so many other tourists. What he saw in verse 16 was a city full of idols and bereft of the only true one God that could rescue them. And he saw that plainly. The language in verse 16 is more like he saw a city swamped with idols, smothered with idols. And here were the images of Apollo, the god of art, 
and sport. Bacchus, the party god. Ares, the god of violence. Aphrodite, the god of sex. Hermes, the god of travel and communication. And these gods were set up all over the city and they were carved in um, ivory and marble and they were built out of um, silver and gold and they were made by the greatest artists of their day. And they were gobsmackingly beautiful. And yet, um, one historian said, if you went to Athens, you were more likely to run into a god than you were another human being first. (laughs) But Paul saw this city and the word for him looking here is not just to go and have a look around. It's to look underneath. It's to see beyond what's showing and is apparent. He looks underneath and he sees not physical statues but a whole city of people running and undergirded by an idol factory, economically, politically and recreationally. That's what made it work. And he looks beyond the spectacle that everyone else goggles at and he sees what it is, what it truly is, what made that city tick. And that takes some discernment and some looking. A friend of mine runs a large city church in Melbourne. It attracts a lot of city workers. And uh, there was a guy who came in and slid into the back seat of their church and started coming regularly and gradually got to know my friend, the pastor, who um, took him out and started to get to know him. And then he wanted to find out about Christianity, became a Christian. And then this guy was really schmick. Like, he was a high-profile investment banker. He lived in a penthouse apartment in the Docklands in Melbourne. He had everything that opened and shut. He was rolling in money. But soon after he became a Christian, on one of those catch-ups with the pastor, he slid a ring across the table to him and said, you need to take this. I never want to see this again. Well, the pastor thought, This is unusual. (laughs) Um, So I asked, you know, a little detail here about this ring, just in case there was somebody in his life that, uh, you know, he hadn't told about. And the guy said to him, this is actually my membership to a high-class brothel in Melbourne. And although it was fun for a while, eventually it owned my soul through sexual addiction. And since meeting Jesus, I don't want to step foot in that place again. It'll destroy me. So what does a pastor do with a gift like that? (laughs) I mean, it's like something out of Lord of the Rings. Do you sort of make your way to Mordor and fling it into the (laughs) the fires of Mount Doom or something? But that fellow had insight, didn't he? He looked and he could really see what was going on in his own life. And that's what Paul does here. He has clarity. He has a true perspective. And he can look beyond the facade to reality. And he sees a city captured by idols. How do you work out what the idols at the, be- at the bedrock of somebody's life? Well, just ask, what if taken away would cause their life to unravel before them? What would cause their life to unravel if it was taken away? There's nothing wrong with fitness, a party, a nice home, holidays, a good job. But, oh, yes, there is when they become the very centre of your reason for being. Paul really looked and he saw a city that was drowning in idolatry. Drowning in idolatry. That's what he saw. What did he feel? Verse 16, he felt great distress. This emotion is really important to get your head around because, or your heart around because it's what motivates the whole way he moves from here in the rest of this chapter. It's translated as stirred up or provoked in spirit or a sharp sense of, of indignation here. But it's a much, it it sounds like it's a sudden sort of shift, but it's a deep abiding sense of distress that comes over him as he walks through this city. 
And it's a word that's associated with God in the Old Testament upon seeing his own people worshipping the golden calf. So Paul is just mirroring something of God at this point. It's an indignation, I suppose a jealousy. Why jealousy? Well, you know, we think jealousy is a bad thing, you know, the green-eyed monster. And it can be, you know, if you're wanting somebody else's looks or their lifestyle or their job or whatever else. But jealousy sometimes can be a good thing, particularly if you're dealing with an intruder in a marriage. So jealousy here is important. Isaiah 42, God says, I am the Lord, that's my name. I will not give my glory to another, nor my praise to idols. So this is what moves Paul, you see. It's not, it's not, that, it's not a bad temper. It's not even sheer obedience to the Great Commission. It's not even that he loves people who he can see are lost. The primary thing that's getting him going here is that people are getting ripped off and they're not honouring the true God that deserves honour and praise. So how do you channel that sort of feeling of indignation? Let me give you one possibility. A few years ago, we got some free entry tickets, you know, pre-party tickets to the Fringe, to the Garden of Unearthly Delights with a couple of friends. So we went along, and as we walked closer to the entrance, there on the ground was... God is love. And I thought, oh, the Christians are out in the fringe. Isn't that great, you know? And as we walk closer, the messages got more urgent and more violent, really. They, they just got angrier. So that by the time we got to the entrance, there were the Adelaide Street preachers, and they were really abusing people as they walked over the line, almost like they were walking into hell as they crossed over the line into that um, garden. Well, I guess that's one option open to you if you've got uh, a sense of indignation of people not honouring God for who he is in life. It's one option Paul could have had open to him. Another one might be to weep over the state of the city, you know, particularly in Adelaide, you know, you think we're, we're supposed to be of all the capital cities, the city of churches. We had the free, you know, society and the, the start with, you know, persecuted Christians coming here to escape uh, persecution in other parts of the world. So, uh, you know, it's a, it's a great history. We could, we could whinge about losing that legacy and us not knowing our history anymore generally. That's another response. But Paul's distress leads neither to ambivalence nor ranting. And nor does he shut down. It, 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 that feeling drives him to want to engage yeah. with the people. Paul sees a city full of idols and his heart is provoked. And that provocation says, I want to connect. I want to connect with these people. Uh, look at verse 17. He reasoned at the synagogue with the god on the Sabbath... And then he went to the marketplace for the rest of the week. You can miss this. Reason in the synagogue with the people who are already sort of somewhat on side. And then he went to the marketplace for the rest of the week. That place was called the Agora. Um, look, there's a very small picture of it there. <laughs> or maybe it's big. Oh, it's bigger there. Okay. Okay. Um, but that's a picture of the, the market in Istanbul, the present-day market in Istanbul, which is one of the largest in the world. It's got everything you could ever want there. But it's very hard for us to understand because we think of markets as places of commodities that you go and buy things and take them home. But the markets that we're talking about here in Acts, the Agora, was also a place where you traded ideas, philosophies, ways of life, world views. It was exchange central. And if you wanted it, you could get it at the Agora. And Paul thinks, I'm going to take the gospel into the Agora. <laughs> I'm going to put it there where everybody's looking at everything. Yeah. Now, I don't know what the equivalent of the Agora is for us. It is hard to work that out. But maybe, maybe for you, I don't know, where do people talk 
about their ideas, their values, what they think is important in life, what they're going to live for. Where do they do that? Some people do it at the pub. Some people do it when they go to a community market. Some people do it at the school drop-off. Some people do it in the paper through, uh, you know, the local news rag. Some people do it on the internet. But you need to think about where the agora is or its equivalent for you. Paul reasons with the two prevailing worldviews of that city, the Epicureans, and they basically, their life was driven by pleasure, and then the Stoics. And the Stoics, basically, their philosophy was, um, look, if bad things happen to you in life, just suck it up, because the gods have actually chosen to give you that, and you just got to you know, put up with it and get through it. And he reasoned with those two worldviews, and engage with them. And that's what got him hauled up to the Areopagus, which was sort of like a combination of something like our parliament and our university all rolled into one. And Paul really, he's only doing what, if you read the book of Proverbs, says God's people should do. Because it's Proverbs tells you that wisdom is not found locked up in a religious building. It's actually out there crying out on the streets to people. So Paul takes this gospel and it gets him to the Areopagus, the supreme educative council in the city. You know, um, City Bible from a few years ago, we made an event which was we, we did an event which in the lead up to Easter and we got other churches involved in it as well. But we did it at the State Library and this is sort of like the unique thing that City Bible Forum can do is we can put on things on behalf of everyone. Um, and so we did this debate. Well, it wasn't a debate. It was a discussion about whether the resurrection of Jesus should be put in the fiction or the non-fiction section of the State Library. And we got two historians to help and two um, lawyers. And then we had it chaired by John Anderson, who was a former Deputy Prime Minister in Australia. So it was a pretty high-profile high thing, and it got a lot of buzz. It got a bit of media coverage. And, but the best thing for me was, the fantastic thing was, the wife of the atheist lawyer who decided to de debate against the resurrection happening... Um, she said at the end of the night, she was just reflecting, waiting for her husband, and she said, you know, I, we don't get to talk like this anymore in Australia. You know, the only time I talk like this is after I've had a few too many drinks at a dinner party with friends, and it's safe. And I thought, that's why it's important to be out there, isn't it? It engaged people, it connected with people, and actually it provided a host of opportunities from there to keep talking about the resurrection. I mean, it's amazing to talk about the resurrection in a public place in the lead up to Easter. It's just amazing. Anyway, this is so countercultural to modern thinking uh, because what most people are telling you these days is your faith is a private world and you don't want to bring it into the public square, please. Just leave it at home. That's fine. You can do what you want in the privacy of your own world, but don't bring it out. Don't tell me what God I should worship. And Paul says, oh, I'm sorry, there are people out shopping and I've got to be there. I've got to say, this is the way. This is the God you're looking for. Some people treat the gospel a little bit like it's a rare artwork. You know, um, I don't know whether you've ever been to those sort of haughty-toity galleries where you go in and, and everything's under lock and key and everybody is staring over you. You know, if you go within, you know, <laughs> five metres of the artwork, we're going to back, 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 you know. We don't want to damage it. I don't think the gospel is like that. I think the gospel is more like the pigs in Rundle Mall. That's public art. Have you seen what they do to those pigs? <laughs> What sort of photos are taken with those pigs? People don't even walk past, people walk past them and don't even notice they're there sometimes. And then other people go, oh, look at those. And that is more what the gospel is. It's open to public scrutiny. It's open to people looking at it closely or tossing it aside. And as Christians, we need to follow the Bible's lead at this point and not our current culture. The Bible says 
No, 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 your faith in Jesus is perfectly fine to be out there in the public square. It's part of your life. You don't want to leave that parked behind, you know, in the umbrella stand here at church when you leave and then pick it back up again when you walk into the place. No, you want to take it with you when you go to whatever God's taking you to this week. Paul really looked underneath this city and he saw the idols. He was provoked by that and that drove him to want to connect with the people. And he was neither obnoxious nor cowardly in the way that he went about that. The vast majority of people who don't believe in Jesus don't actually have an accurate picture of what it is anyway. So that's even more reason why we need to be out there. Because they've got some movie that they remembered from years ago about some you know, idiot minister who did something on the screen and then the gay couple were far more together. And that's their picture of what Christianity is. Do you understand why it's so important for the gospel, your gospel faith, to be up to scrutiny, to be able to be examined in the public sphere and not to retreat from that space and listen to culture? Finally, what did Paul say? It's really important to understand that this is not all he said. This is a little bit of a summary of the highlights of what he said because after all, verse 18 says he's been there talking about Jesus for the week, you know, at least. Some have criticised this uh, chapter in the book of Acts and they say, oh, there's no talk of the cross here so we can't really say it's a good sermon from Paul. But actually... From verse 18, it's clear that he has talked about Jesus to people and he has talked about what Jesus has done. So let's look at what he says on this one occasion in Athens that he gets the chance to go before the Areopagus. Firstly, verse 23, he comments on the Athenians first before he talks about God. There's a great little tip there. Talks about them first and what he notices And what does he notice? He says, gosh, you guys have an enormous capacity for gods. You know, I've been walking around this city. There's a god on every corner. And you know what? You've even covered the base so that if a god turned up that you hadn't thought of to the unknown god, well done, guys, great initiative. You know, you want not many people would think like this. Well, you know that. Unknown God that you've got it for, you've got a statue for over there. That's the one I want to talk about with you right now. Very, very clever. Verse 24, what does he say? That God has turned up, and that God is the God who created everything, not some bits of the universe. And any attempt to try and squeeze him down and put him into a human temple that you've made is ludicrous. Because verse 25, we don't build temples for God. God builds a world for us to live in. He sustains life. Verse 26, it's not a local deity belonging to a particular tribe or village or race or nation. In fact, he created all the nations from one human and determined where we would live both in time and space. Verse 28, we're in fact the children of God in the sense that We're made in his image, rather than us running around trying to capture God in ours. He comes near to us, and we sort of play this little dance where we sidestep him, he says. Verse 30, God has been patient, but now calls on us to return to him because he's coming as our judge, all of us. And he will judge everything with perfect clarity one day because he's in the position to do that. And he's chosen, verse 31, the job spec of judgment to be given to the one he's resurrected, Jesus. The only perfect man who could sustain God's judgment, die and come back to life again. Jesus is now God's judge. Can you see what he's done with this? Can you see what he's done? He says, God makes the heaven and the earth. He can't be contained in a, in a human shelter that you build for him. God makes us in his image. We're not making God in ours. We are the invention of God, not God the invention of us. 
God makes all people. People keep trying to localise gods to particular groups. We judge which God will select. No, no, no. God's going to judge you one day on whether you've picked the right one. The resurrected Christ. At every point, this is a direct hit on the nature of their own idolatry. So what I want to encourage you here to think about is this. When you're confronted by a family member or someone in your team at work or in your city or in a culture that's swamped by a sea of idols and varying opinions on who God is, what he might be like, all that sort of thing, what do you do? You keep on painting a picture of the God of the Bible clearly to them. You don't assume that when you say the word God, you both mean the same thing. Now, how do they react to this? Well, verses 32 to 34 says there's a bit of a varied response. So you have the sneering, sort of mocking group over one end. Then you have the, oh, okay, we'll come back and we'll hear this again. And then you have the belief in what he said. Now, the sneer, you know, the first reaction, I look at that and I think, oh, yeah, that's what they're going to do every time, you know, because <laughs> I have a very small view of the gospel and what it can do to people. But the sneer is there, but it's a cop-out. You know, it's the rolling of the eyes. The person doesn't even expend any energy trying to give a reason to you why they don't believe. So push them around a little. Because it's an incredibly arrogant and dangerous position. It's one that you can afford to be in when everybody else just nods. But the second two are really surprising. Paul's proclamation leads to more engagement, not less. We think speaking will close doors, not open them. The reaction at Athens says, no, no, the opposite can happen. And certainly that's been my experience um, working with people in the city is that they actually are surprised when they see that people are interested in talking about God. So we do this thing, one-to-one Bible reading with people, and I came out a few years ago and did some training workshops on this. But when we do it, we do it in two parts. So the first part, we, we give people some, you know, sort of ideas on what it will involve. And then we say the challenge, before you come back next week, is to just pray that God will give you an invitation to invite someone to read the Bible with you, one-to-one. And you can see people going, yeah, as if that's going to happen in the next week. They say, well, we're not asking you to force yourself on people. Just pray. Just see what happens. And then the next week when you get back, you go around the room, and there's usually a few people there. At least a few people there go, um... I can't believe it, but um, I really need to look over this material properly now because I've got a real live one coming. (laughs) The Bible keeps reminding us that when you engage people with the gospel, it actually does open doors. It doesn't always close them. So how do you respond to a city of idols? A city of idols. There are four things that Paul does here in a sequence that could help you to take your faith with you this week where he puts you. He saw, he felt, he acted, and then he spoke. And that sequence is important, isn't it? He saw, he felt, he acted, and then he spoke. Maybe we don't speak because we haven't really connected. Maybe we don't connect because we don't really feel. And maybe we don't feel because we're not really looking in our busy lives. Which part of the sequence needs your focus? I mean, what do you see? I've got a friend who, um, he's a mainland atheist Chinese and he's been seconded in Adelaide to work in a company here for several years. I just said to him, I was curious, I said, how do you go about relating to your work team? You know, this is a complete world away from where you were. And he goes, oh, well, you know, I'm learning. So Bill, he's into the horse races. So I pick up a racing guide on the weekend and then I see him on Monday and say to him, 
wow, wasn't that interesting? Race five at Sandown on the weekend. You know? And he said, Linda, she loves real estate. So I always look through and think, see what houses sold on the weekend. Say, isn't that amazing, that house that went for over a million, you know, in Northgate or whatever. And then he said, you know, Maddie, she watches some soap opera thing. I don't understand it, but I watch it. And then I come in and I say, I can't believe that Kyle's dropped Briny again, you know. <laughs> he just studies the people around him in an attempt to relate to them. And we have far more at stake, don't we, as Christians, as Christ's ambassadors with a message of life, to really try and get to know these people and what makes them tick. I was rebuked by what he did. Paul saw a city swamped by idols. Can you? We live in a city calibrated towards pleasure. You know, pleasure is the paradigm for everything these days. What you eat, you know, where you live, how you're going to organise your retirement. And the language of fulfilment has replaced the language of service. At my son's university graduation, and I was just so surprised to hear the Chancellor say to these physiotherapists who were going out, now it's your chance to serve. I haven't heard that for a long time. I've heard, now you've got your education behind you, now you can do everything you wanted to do with yourself and you can be whatever you want to be. That's been the message that I've heard in education over the last decade. The language of fulfilment has replaced the language of service. What do you see? What do you feel? Do you feel this holy jealousy for the honouring and the glory of Jesus in people's lives? The indignation that idols are receiving the worship that really God should have. And does that provoke you to action? On what sort of action? Does it, you know, are you ambivalent? Do you sort of roll your eyes and give up? Do you shout? Or does it drive you to want to connect and to engage? To allow that gospel to be scrutinised and examined and reasoned with in the public square. It's scary stuff, but God's there with you. And that is neither obnoxious nor cowardly. And what happens when you do get that opportunity? Well, you paint a bigger picture of who God is in a supermarket of God's. So which one do you think you need to work on this week? See, feel, act, or speak? The Bible keeps telling us that people are not worship neutral. You know, page after page it says, you either engage with the true and living God, or the other type of people are those that give themselves to false gods. And that has not changed for millennia. Can you see the gods that capture your friends and your family and your work colleagues? Because the gods are out there. They're everywhere. They may not you know, be sculpted on the side of the road anymore, but people live for Aphrodite, the god of sex, Apollos, the god of sport, Bacchus, the god of revelry. And these gods are out there and they will never forgive you if you fail them. They're unforgiving. And they will never satisfy you if you try to nail them down and secure them. Les Murray, the poet, has this great line in one of his poems. It says, The true God gives us his flesh and blood. An idol demands yours of you. The true God will give you his flesh. And blood. An idol keeps demanding yours of you. See, feel, act, or speak. Think which one you're going to work on this week as a follow up from what you've been doing over the last few days. We're going to sing and uh, stand with me and use this song as a chance to commit the coming week and what you've learned at the conference to God. Thank you.